Hacker by MDB is a web-based platform that lets you interrogate and mine and visualize even really complex microbiome studies, okay? Um, I just wanna just, so we're all on the same page, define what a microbiome actually is. Um, and there's a lot of definitions that, that, you, um, that you may find uh, circulating, but I, I really like this one, which is um, from an old publication on, on fungi, but it defines a microbiome as a microbial community occupying a reasonably well-defined habitat, which has distinct physiochemical properties. Um, and I think those are three key terms that, um, that are really critical when we think about microbiomes, a community, a habitat, and functions, carrying out some role um, in, in the microbiome. Um, okay, so uh, as, as you may be aware, the microbiome has been implicated in a really diverse array of biological processes. And that's why we want web-based tools to interrogate it because we'd like to understand the details of how microbiomes are associated with different host phenotypes or different disease states. And I'll give some examples of that today in, in the way we'll use microbiome DB. All right, just as a quick sort of uh, point of reference, this is a screenshot of the landing page for Clinepi, right next to us, the same screenshot from Microbiome DB. Um, and you don't have to look very close to see a lot of similarities in the aesthetics or the user interface, if you will. Um, and so there, these, these go further than just look and feel. Um, so uh, as an example for the, the global enteric multicenter study, the GEM study that we've already been talking about, uh, Clinepi has data for, I think, over 22,000 uh, participants. Is that right, Sheena? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, at, at, across seven sites. And when you carry out searches in Clinepi, as you've already seen, those searches return to you uh, data from participants or data from observations. Um, and so, so in, as, as a comparison, if you look at the same GEMS study on microbiome DB, you're not going to find 22,000 participants, you're only gonna find 1,000. And the reason for that is that th the microbiome study on GEMS was only carried out on a subset of those original participants. And so that's the data that we've loaded. We've loaded all of the microbiome data for the 1,000 participants that were evaluated um, uh, in, in this particular study. And those 1,000 participants don't come from seven sites, they come from four sites. And unlike Clinepi, when you search on microbiome DB, your searches return samples. And that's a little bit of a, um, a nuance that's an important one. When you carry out a query on microbiome DB, no matter how you query, what you get back are samples, stool samples or skin swabs, whatever happened to be collected in that study, you get the microbiome data back for those samples, all right? Um, I'll just highlight that this is an evolving uh, um, uh, partnership or relationship between the two sites. Um, they both are built on the same infrastructure that allows us to have this consistent look and feel across the two sites. Um, and we're making progress and, and hopefully moving forward more quickly now with making connections between the two sites to, so that if you were querying GEMS data on Clinepi and you found that there was microbiome data available for some of those samples, you could quickly and easily hop over to microbiome DB and be working with the same samples, um, looking at their microbiome data. And those are connections that we're gonna be building um, in, in the very near future. I also just wanna highlight that we have a, additional enteric disease data sets available on both sites. Um, and a good example of this is the MAUI-D study for which there is a tremendous amount of clinical and epidemiological data on ClinepiDB, um, and also uh, thousands of samples worth of microbiome data on microbiome DB. So it's not just GEMS for which we have data on, on both. Any, before I go any further, are there any questions about this connection between ClinepI and MicrobiomeDB and how we, um, uh, how we relate to each other? Remember, don't be afraid to speak up, happy to, to, um, to kind of talk in more detail about any of these things. And let, let me also point out for, uh, uh, there's a wide range of, of, of people in the audience with different backgrounds and different interests. Uh, some of the people on the call will be very familiar with the genomic uh, resources that we have, have provided for decades, including information 
on uh, genomic data for enteric disease pathogens, for example, entamoeba or Giardia. And those are also built on the same platform. And so just as Dan has highlighted the emerging opportunities to query between ClinepiDB and MicrobiomeDB, uh, the same likely applies for access to genomic information, whether it has to do with variation in, in, in mosquitoes or uh, uh, or, or isolates of, of cryptosporidium or whatever. Yeah, and, and I would just extend on that and say that the other real advantage of this from, from your perspective, for those of you who are attending this workshop, is that once you learn how to navigate one site, um, you, you really know how to navigate um, microbiome DB. If, if, you've, if you've learned on Clinepi, you know how to navigate the kinds of genomic sites that David just referred to. It's like you have a common informatics uh, language, if you will, of interacting with these sites that you can leverage to, to learn about um, a various different uh, large data sets. Um, and so that's really to your advantage. And, and although the sites change at different rates and have different features that come online, they all have a, um, a, a point and click way of interacting with them, which makes it very easy for you to learn how to use them. Hi, okay. can I ask one question? Yes, please go ahead. Can you, um, yes, you say your name? Yes. Uh, yep, that's Moon from Mahidan University. So okay. uh, let's say even going to link the data from from these two uh, platform. That means the day the the same. Okay, that set of data from enteric disease have to come from the same population. If I say from epidemiology, uh, right? Yep. But it doesn't have to be from exactly the same person that we correct or you have to be? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. So in the case of GEMS uh, and, and well, in, let's talk about GEMS specifically. In the case of GEMS, yes, the data is coming from exactly the same participants. Okay, so you can think of it as, a, as a, a, if, if this is the, the universe of samples from the GEMS participants, we have a subset of those participants for which we have microbiome data. Okay, so so they are the same participants. Um, and the same thing with the MALED study. Um, so, uh, so those same participants are, have data available on ClinEpi and MicrobiomeDB. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I just want to make sure that not only collected in the same location, but it have to be from the same person. Same person, exactly. Other questions? That's a great question. Okay. Um, so I, before I jump over to microbiome DB, just to highlight what, one of the real interests, uh, well, interests of mine, but also I think the, one of the focus points of microbiome DB is on enteric disease in, um, in the very young. And so we, we have a lot of data around that topic. And I just have listed in a, in a brief table some of those data sets here. Uh, and including MALED from, from a healthy cohort and a cohort with enteric disease from GEMS. And if I put a, a star by these, it's because they're on Clinepi as well. Uh, the Mordor study of azithromycin treatment, that's got a white star here because it will soon be on, on both sites eventually. Um, and we have other data sets on microbiome DB that are not on Clinepi like all of the diapamune study that included um, uh, uh, pediatric participants from Russia, Estonia, and Finland, um, the ECAM study that was carried out in birth to two-year-olds in the United States, and a large cohort of, uh, of, of uh, uh, healthy individuals from Bangladesh uh, that sampled microbiome every month uh, throughout the first five years of life to understand the development of the microbiome at, during early, uh, early life. So uh, in total, that's over 2,000 participants, about 10,000 samples of what we call 16S data. And for those of you who aren't familiar with microbiome data sets, that's, it's basically a simple, uh, straightforward way to use sequencing to identify the composition of the microbiome. But we also have more uh, uh, rich data sets that we would call shotgun metagenomics, where instead of just using a simple sequencing approach, they actually se sequence everything in the stool or on the skin swab to get a more comprehensive picture of what's present in which microbes are present in a sample and what they might be doing. 
These studies span the first two to five years of life with highly frequent sampling monthly in, in many cases. Um, and they cover 13 countries across five continents. Now, these are all published studies. Almost all of the data we host on MicrobiomeDB is published. Um, and we pull from those publications to get the clinical metadata and also the, um, the, the, of course, the microbiome data. But we also do host some unpublished data. And I'll show you in a minute that you can actually analyze your own data, microbiome data, privately on the site as well. OK. So um, before I jump to the site, I like to just have a slide of a static site so you can, I can point out a few things to you. The first is that just like Clinepi, you can have a user account. And the Clinepi folks will correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I believe if you have a user account on Clinepi, it also works on MicrobiomeDB. I'm right about that, correct? Yep. yep. Same, thing with, same thing with the genomic sites that, that David Roos mentioned. One account gives you access to all the sites. Um, and having an account lets you share and save all your work, okay? So it's really useful to have an account, um, really no reason not to. Um, uh, you can click on our Vimeo link in the upper right to see some of our video tutorials. Again, just like on Clinepi, you click on this community menu, you're gonna be able to find out lots of like details about how the site works and what went into it and who's involved. And then under the workspace menu on MicrobiomeDB, there's an option called My Data Sets where you can actually upload your own data. And um, there's a whole tutorial about how to do this. I'd encourage you to check that out. And we can even um, help you if you need to go from raw sequence data all the way through to analysis on MicrobiomeDB, all while keeping your data private. We have a workflow that will accommodate that as well. So uh, again, check out the tutorial videos and look at the workspace menu. Um, but the rest of the page really looks exactly like Clinepi. We have a card that represents each study. And clicking on any one of those cards lets you query that individual microbiome uh, study or data set. But we also have an additional cross-study query card, which I think is really cool, that lets you interrogate multiple studies at one time. So you can carry out a meta-analysis. And I'll show you an example of that in, in just a minute. Um, just as a quick orientation for the cards, uh, the top of the card contains the study name. In the case of today's demo, uh, we'll do the GEMS uh, 1 study. Uh, of course, we link to the study details if you want to know more the publications, more details about the study. Uh, and Clinepi does an excellent job of really providing a rich detail um, page for, for their studies. So be sure to check those out. A brief description, just some bullet points so that you know what kind of study it was, how many samples, et cetera, where it was conducted. Um, a link to a publication on, on the microbiome site, we have that at the top of the card. Um, and then a link to access raw data. And again, this may differ between microbiome and Clinepi, how these data are structured and how you can access them. But uh, we, we do have a, a, a quick link to that. Um, but what's different here, and I alluded to this earlier, is how you search the database for microbiome DB um, compared to Clinepi. And we have two searches, and I hope if I have time, I'll get through both of them today. The first is that you can search the entire database or just a single study to find samples based on metadata uh, that the experimenters collected about those samples. Um, uh, we call that uh, sample details. You can just call it metadata. Uh, but those are things like age, weight, um, disease status, country of origin, et cetera. You can imagine those can be quite large um, metadata uh, annotations. Um, and then we have a second way to query the database or an individual study, which is to say, you know, I don't care about any of the metadata. I don't care whether the child was five or whether this is an adult or whether it's a skin swab or a stool sample. I just want to know all the samples that had E. coli above 80% of the, of the microbiome. Okay. So that's called a tax. We call that a query by taxon, finding samples based on the abundance of a particular taxon. So we'll do, do both of those. So I want to pause at this point and just see if there are um, any questions uh, so that we understand things going into uh, the, the exercises. No questions? None? Okay. Okay, so 
I, what I did was put together a few um, example questions uh, and I'll pose the question and I'll pose an approach and then I'll walk you through it. So we're not gonna do exercises where you fill in anything um, just because in the interest of time, we just have this, this 45 minutes. So we have about a half hour left. So in the remaining half hour, I'm gonna work through two or three examples, spending about 10 minutes on each one um, to give you a sense for how the database works. And again, at any time, click on the button you know, in Zoom to raise your hand. If I don't see your hand, uh, Sheena or Nupur or David will see it and, um, and can, can stop me or come off of mute and just stop me yourself, okay? All right, so the first example, and this is um, one in which we'll turn to gems for the answer, is how does diarrheal disease affect the microbiome during early life developments, okay? The microbiome has been implicated in being an important organ system, if you will, that facilitates nutrient acquisition from diet, that facilitates growth and development and immune development. So what happens when a child early in life um, has a diarrheal disease, how does the microbiome change? And so the GEMS data set's a great data set to address this question because we have a fairly large, well, because it's early life data, but we also have a fairly large cohort of healthy controls and a large cohort uh, that had um, moderate to severe diarrheal disease or MSD. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna hop over to uh, MicrobiomeDB. I'm on the site here. And I wanna take just a second before I jump into this to highlight something really, really important. There are differences in the, the, the way you sort through and find and explore data in Clinepi um, with, with what I'm gonna show you here for MicrobiomeDB, but we are rapidly moving towards the same look and feel of data exploration um, that, that you already saw with Clinepi. So, the, the kind of aesthetics, the look and feel, where you click and how you interact with it um, in what I show you today may look different in six months, but it would look more like ClinEpi, not less. So, um, so just so you're aware of that and know so that there are no surprises if you log onto the site in, in a year and you say, well, this looks different. Um, these sites are always developing. They're not static at all. Okay. So just like ClinEpi, we have these studies listed across the top. Um, we have a little over 30,000 samples um, for which uh, we have microbiome data. That's a much smaller number of um, data points, so to speak, than Clinepi, but, um, but a tremendous amount of microbiome data. Uh, so I'm going to type gems in here just to search my cards. And here's the Global Enteric Multicenter study, about 500 uh, MSD cases and a, a roughly the same number of endemic controls again, from four sites in this case, Bangladesh, the Gambia, Kenya, and Mali. Um, they used a particular sequencing approach that is actually not uh, that commonly used now, but that's to sequence this very um, short region and early region in the 16S rRNA gene of bacteria. Okay, so remember, I told you there's two ways to interact with these data, interrogating the data by sample details or metadata, or by taxon abundance. I'm gonna start by querying the data by sample details. Now, this is where things look different than ClinEpi, and this is where things will look more like ClinEpi as we go um, uh, uh, forward uh, for development. So uh, what I have here is really a, a, a tree of metadata about these samples. And I'll tell you right now, this tree looks a lot smaller than what you saw on, or what you would see on ClinEpi for, for GEMS. And that's because when they published the microbiome data, they actually didn't care about this huge universe of metadata associated with GEMS. They just cared about whether the, the samples came from children who had MSD or who did not. And they also cared about the country, right? And, and they really didn't collect a whole lot of other, they didn't use a whole lot of other metadata, even though it had been collected for those children. So I don't know if that makes sense to people. If it doesn't, please um, uh, let me know. But what that means is we have pretty sparse metadata represented on microbiome DB for the exact same participants that, that you would see on, on ClinEpi where there's far more metadata. And so one of the things that's gonna happen moving forward is we're gonna be able to draw on that much larger universe of, of clinical metadata and epidemiological data that's on ClinEpi and pull it into microbiome DB um, if, if, if that makes sense. Are, are there questions about that? I heard somebody come off of mute.
Okay. All right, so things look different here than Clinepi, but they will be looking more like Clinepi. All right, um, so you can see they, they collected information about the age group, um, about the host body habitat, which was just um, stool or colon, uh, samples from the colon. We know whether the sample came from a participant that was a case or a control. Um, we know which country they came from. And again, you see these same sort of frequency distributions that um, you saw on Clinepi. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, um, is, is just, I, I'm not going to filter the data at all. I'm gonna take all approximately 1,000 samples, 1,015 samples, and I'm gonna move those forward to the next step of the workflow here. And when I do that, um, what we get is a list of all 1,015 samples. And if I click on one of those um, samples and I just picked one, I can see this sort of encyclopedic entry, right? What study it came from, all the metadata that we have in MicrobiomeDB because that's what was published in the paper for that study. Um, and uh, a table of the bacteria or taxa, the organisms that were present in the microbiome of this individual sample from this single um, child that was at 30 months and which was a control uh, um, cohort uh, participant from Bangladesh. And I could even sort this table and say, oh, okay, very clear that 50%, 51% of the, and I, I think people can see that, 51% of the microbiome um, composition was just made up of Prevotella, okay? Now that's useful. It can be good for kind of looking at individual samples and seeing what's present in a sample, but really I wanna be able to really understand this data at a much higher level than just a single sample. So I'm gonna go back and um, I'm really gonna move past this kind of um, encyclopedic entry and I'm gonna click on this tab, analyze results. And what you see now is a suite of the data visualization apps that you can launch directly in your browser that you can sort of calibrate and tune and customize, and that will then create graphics uh, that give you a different um, analysis or perspective of the data. So to do this, I'm gonna click on the relative abundance app. And for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with microbiome data, relative abundance is a common approach to understand what is in our sample. In other words, which bugs, which bacteria make up uh, the stool sample or comprise the stool sample in, in this child versus this one. So I'm gonna click on this app and it's gonna launch right in the browser. And it takes just a minute to load. And it does this very quickly with even a thousand samples. And it's done. So. The default display here is it displayed bacteria or organisms at the phylum level, so very high up, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, and it's showing the top uh, four, in this case, the top four median, more, top four phyla by median abundance. And it hasn't looked or considered any of the metadata yet. So this isn't that useful to me to look at. I mean, I guess it's useful to know that there's a lot of firmicutes, a lot of bacteroidea, a lot of proteobacteria or actinobacteria, bacteroidea. But I really want to get a, a more detailed analysis here. So I'm going to click on this taxonomic level and I'm going to go down to genus. Okay, now instead of high level phylum, I'm looking way down at genus. And I can see that Prevotella is the most abundant genre in the stool of these children from GEMS, followed by Escherichia shigella, so E. coli shigella, and those two are so similar um, uh, that they're difficult to tell apart or impossible to tell apart by the method used here. Um, Streptococcus um, and, and Faecali bacterium, Bacteroides and others. Still though, this is not that useful of a graph because it hasn't really considered any of the metadata that was collected on these participants. So I'm gonna click on this sample details menu. And now you see the real power of the site, which is all of the sample details, all the metadata collected from these participants and these samples is now available to you in a drop-down menu to facet or color the plot. 
So for example, I could choose case or control. That was our question, right? How does the composition of the microbiome change depending on whether this person had, this participant had uh, moderate to severe diarrhea, MSD, or whether it was a control individual. And I can see that there's, um, now I have my Prevotella, E. coli, Shigella, Streptococcus, but now I get a different bar for the cases in red or the controls. And there were a couple samples in this data set that were not, and it's really just a couple that were not recorded as case or control. So I'm gonna click those off. These graphs are customizable. Um, and now I can see some pretty big differences, um, at least subjectively by eye. There's a lot more Prevotella in the controls. There's a lot less E. coli Shigella. So the cases that participants with, with MSD had much higher levels of E. coli Shigella much higher levels of streptococcus. Um, and, and, and so I see clear impacts of diarrheal disease on the microbiome. Now, it would help to do this by some other metric other than just me eyeballing things and saying, oh, these look different. So once I've zeroed in on a few taxa that look different, like E. coli Shigella or Prevotella, I can explore those a bit more in the single taxon tab. Um, and I can see that uh, indeed there is a highly significant, I don't know if you can see this, a p-value of, of zero really, that these cases and controls are different from each other. I could do the same with E. coli Shigella if I want. And again, highly significant by a Wilcoxon rank sum test. Highly significant difference between cases and controls. Okay, I want to just pause there for a minute to see if there are um, questions. So very quickly, I took a thousand samples for which there's microbiome data. I split them by case and control. I identified trends, differences in the microbiome, and then I was able to look at statistical significance of those differences all within a single data visualization app. Questions about that? Dan, I have a remedial question. What does OTU stand for on that single taxon tab you were looking at? Yeah, that's so that that's a term very specific to the microbiome world of operational taxonomic unit. It's it's sort of a proxy for thinking about a species, um, and it's it's a clustering of sequences together that share ninety seven percent identity or higher. Um, and so it puts very similar sequences together in a bin, and then we put a label on that bin for taxa. And that's, that's traditionally how we think of assigning identity to, um, to a set of sequences, really. Very Did good you question. The country, what will it look like? Ah, great question. What would it look like if we did this by country? All right, so great question. Um, let's uh, go back here to our sample results. Um, let's, uh, sorry, go back to our, our data visualization app. Um, and instead of case control, I can just toggle to country. And this is exactly, it's a great question because it's exactly how you would explore these complex data sets. It's just clicking a menu and toggling between different sample details to identify changes. I'm going to go back over to top taxa. And now we see, instead of uh, the colors referring to case or control, um, we can see that uh, we have Bangladesh, the Gambia, Kenya, and Mali. Um, and we can see actually pretty big differences. Um, Prevotella, much more common in the Gambia and Kenya in the, in the guts of these kids, compared to Bangladesh or Mali, OK? Um, and I don't know if that's significant, um, but we could check. Uh, let's check Prevotella. It's not, at least not by a Kruskal Wallace test, um, but, but th there's certainly trends. And I'll, I'm going to show you some more of these trends in, in just a minute. Uh, Dan, um, yeah. just, just a uh, follow up to um, I'm not uh, uh, question. Uh, that uh, that particular question about being able to uh, uh, explore this data in one particular country is a good one, but it simply highlights the point that Dan made 
that for these data, we have a wealth of very valuable metadata that is associated with the studies loaded into ClinepiDB. And so you can imagine that if you were interested in the GEMS microbiome data and wanted to restrict your analysis to uh, two-year-olds or children under, uh, under six months or those who had previously been, uh, or th those who were, um, who were diagnosed with a Campylobacter infection, um, you could do this to try to explore those particular uh, differences. Um, let me also point out that there was a, a question in the comment uh, um, fr from Dr. Mutegi about, uh, about what happens with data that users upload to analyze their, their own microbiome data. And Nippur has entered a response to that, uh, but, but if there are uh, answers that, if there are additional questions, uh, either you or others are welcome to type them into the chat and we'll continue to monitor and, and answer them there or raise them up uh, later on. Yeah, Nupur, thank you for fielding that question. I, it's hard when you're screen sharing to see the, yes. the chat or the questions, so I appreciate that. Dr. Zoned, did you have a question? I saw you just came off mute. Um, I think he has microphone problems. Okay. No, that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going. Um, and I'm just kind of returning to the presentation here just to highlight that um, just as uh, the, the, the previous uh, question highlighted, we don't have to focus on diarrheal disease. We can, we can ask about age or country. And so I wanna take a minute just to explore how the microbiome changes as children in the GEM study um, aged as they developed. And so I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna examine age-related changes uh, in uh, the control cohort from GEMS, and we're gonna compare that with the MST cohort, okay? So this will re require, as David alluded to, a little bit of uh, filtering and choosing just you know, very mi minimal filtering, choosing just the, the control cohort um, uh, and, and, and then faceting a visualization based on, on age. Okay, so heading back to microbiome DB, I'm just gonna do this as a new query. Um, I'm gonna start over, going back to the same data set, querying by sample details. I'm gonna take all the countries, I'm not gonna filter on country, but I am going to filter on case or control and I'm just gonna choose the controls, okay? Now, when I say get answer, now, instead of 1,015 samples, I just have those 492 control participants. Um, and I'm going to now um, uh, launch that same relative abundance app and immediately drill down. So once you know how to use an app, it's really easy to quickly set it up. And I'm going to facet this by age group. Okay, so now instead of country or case control status, I'm just looking at how the microbiome changed over time as these children, um, as, as uh, and, and these, these are um, not long, this is not longitudinal data in GEMS, sorry if I gave that impression, but these are children um, who were um, sampled in, in different age groups. And so um, as, as we move through the age groups, you can see these really dramatic changes from um, early, the, the individuals sampled very early in life, zero to six months, and these are month age groups, um, having very, very low Prevotella, but by the time you get to the higher age groups, Prevotella makes up more than half of the microbiome in these stool samples. Uh, conversely, things like Streptococcus, uh, Villanella, or E. coli Shigella come down dramatically. They start very high early in life, it's kind of interesting, right? We think of E. coli and Shigella as being pathogens, but in this, in this case, they appear to be very high in apparently healthy children um, uh, who are very, very young. And as these children develop, the levels of those uh, um, um, microbes come, come way down um, to almost undetectable in, in most children. Great, so, so now that we have a sense of this developmental trajectory for the control group, um, let's, let's modify this and just choose the cases. So I actually can do that directly from here. I can say edit, revise, and I get this a pop-up that looks just like the filter page I showed you earlier. And I'm gonna switch to cases and turn off controls and revise my query. 
and now my app will update. It'll keep all my parameters the same, but now instead of looking at the cases, instead of looking at the controls, I'm looking at the cases. And now what do we see? Well, now we see something, a trend that still resembles the trend we saw in the controls, Prevotella starting low and coming up, but it never reaches that same level. It's not 50%, it's barely 10 or 20% uh, median. It's 13% median. And uh, E. coli Shigella, um, yeah, it still comes down, but it's not undetectable. In fact, it still makes up, you know, a several percentile of the, of the microbiome in these, in these children. So I can um, summarize that if we come back, because I know that's kind of a lot to, so I've, I've, I've taken those shots, screenshots here, just so it makes it a little easier to compare them head to head. And this is something that in the coming year, you're gonna be able to do on MicrobiomeDB, um, and you can already do on Clinepi, which is lay out multiple plots um, uh, and, and, and be able to do that comparison directly in your browser. So this is the control participants in GEMS. Right, so we can see stratifying by age group. That's the key you see on the right-hand side. Prevotella increases by age, approaching 75% of the community, of the microbiome community, by two to five years of age. Um, and E. coli shikella decreases with age, approaching undetectable levels by two to five years. Um, very different in the MSD cases. E. coli shigella are now the dominant taxa because they're the first one on the left-hand side, highest by median relative abundance, um, instead of Prevotella. And they still decrease with age, but they never reach those low levels seen in controls. In contrast, Prevotella, which still increases with age, but it never got anywhere near 75% median abundance like we saw in those control participants. And so one way of interpreting these data is that MSD cases show a delayed maturation of the gut microbiome. And this is actually consistent with been, what's been reported in the literature and other studies of early childhood development and in the context of enteric diseases, and that this delayed matur maturation has potential implications or actually has real implications for energy utilization, for immune system development in these children, and for colonization resistance or protection of the gut against incoming pathogens. Okay, so... Uh, before I go on to the final example, and I know we're short on time, I'm happy to just stop here and, and have a discussion or, or field some questions, and, and, um, uh, or if there's time, I can go on. But are, are there, at this point, are there questions about GEMS or microbiome DB or, or any, anything related to what I just showed? Okay. Nupur, um, how much time do I have left? I want to make you sure. You can have safe. another five to 10 minutes, Dan, for sure. The next session only starts at 10.45, so we have some time. We can have a five-minute, okay. five or 10-minute break before then, so you have a few minutes. Perfect. Um, uh, this one won't take long, but I thought this is an interesting query that will highlight two things I haven't shown you yet. And again, there's a lot about the site I can't show you in the time frame we have, so please reach out to me or check out the video tutorials. Um, so this query or this example rather will highlight two things. One is how to do a query by taxon and the other is how to do a meta-analysis. So uh, this is a question that I, I've always been struck by one of the pieces of, of the results I just showed you, which is E. coli and Shigella being so high so, and so early in life in, in, the, um, in the GI tract of, of children. and so. You know, we have 30,000 plus samples with microbiome data. Why not just ask, where do we see E. coli Shigella across the whole database? What samples have the most E. coli or Shigella in them? And so to do that, to answer that question, I'm going to carry out a meta-analysis using the query by taxon feature. So I'm headed back to microbiome DB. I'm just going to click on the button in the upper left to get back to the home page. And I'm not focusing on gems now. I want to look across the whole database, all the studies, whether that study was a study of, of households in Finland or dogs in the US or cystic fibrosis patients uh, carried out by shotgun metagenomics. I don't care. I just want to know where there's lots of E. coli. So if you remember, we have this card anchored in the left-hand position that is a cross-study analysis card. Okay. And now 
as you can imagine, lots of reasons why comparing uh, two completely different studies might be a bad idea. I can still at least ask where, regardless of how a study was conducted, where they saw or whether they saw E. coli. So I'm going to click now on the Petri dish icon here, which is our indicator for taxon abundance. And now what I get, because I'm on a meta-analysis, is this little walkthrough where I can choose the kinds of data sets I want. Um, and these are all the data sets we have on the site. Or I can choose by taxa. So I could say, you know, uh, in our case, so, so this is a kingdom phylum class order family genus species, uh, and maybe I'll zoom in a bit here, of, of all the taxa detected in all the samples we have, 31,317 um, uh, samples. So I'm just going to search for E. coli or Ashertia. There it is. Genius. I'm going to click on. Nazmul, I'll, I don't know. Okay, I thought maybe Nazmul, you had a question. Um, if you do, no, don't, don't hesitate to ask. All right, now what I see is a distribution of the abundance of uh, E. coli Shigella across all the samples in the database. And in fact, I can see that, you know, thousands of samples have little or no E. coli Shigella in them. And that makes sense. But I see this long tail of samples for which 70, 80, 90% of the microbiome is just E. coli shigella. So I could take whatever cutoff I want. And again, this is just about data exploration. So I could take any sample, whoops, I wanna do not 50 and below, but 50 and above. So I can see that there are 288 samples that have 50% or more of the microbiome made up of E. coli shigella. I'm going to set an even more stringent cutoff and say 70%. And now we're down to 119 samples. And you could set this cutoff wherever you want. But the point is, you're now just going to return samples that fit this filter criteria that had 80% of the microbiome or more made up of E. coli shigella. And by the way, this histogram is all um, customizable. If it's easier for you to look at it on a linear scale, or if you want to change the thin width, you can do that. But once I'm happy with the selection I've made, and I could filter on more than just this, I could also say has to have 70% E. coli and less than 10% Campylobacter or something like that. I can view these 70 samples. And in this case, I'm not going to launch an app at all. I'm actually just going to look at the description of these in the table. And immediately what stands out is that nearly all of these samples are from children. Two months, 0.2 months, seven months, one month, uh, six months. And they're from different studies. This is, uh, I, I know because it's from uh, Estonia and Finland and Russia. This is the diabimune study. Uh, this Peru is from, from Maui D. That's a Maui D study. Um, I'm not sure what these are. These are from the Bangladesh study. Um, and on and on, right? And as I scroll down, even when there's not a description here, um, if I click on one of these samples, I can see that these are from a preterm infant study. Um, so really entirely uh, you know, all of these samples that have very high E. coli Shigella levels are from infants um, or from very, very young children. And so that, I find that really interesting. We think of E. coli Shigella as a pathogen and yet it's highly abundant early in life and then declines as part of the natural development. Why that is, why we have these uh, what we would call facultative anaerobes that are thought of as like microbial weeds being so abundant or so um, dominant in the early infant gut and then being essentially um, overtaken by other organisms, I think is an interesting phenomenon, but it's one we were able to at least um, start to discover here and, 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 uh, and could explore further. Um, so before I close, I'll just highlight that just in the interest of time, I didn't show you any of these other apps, right? And that's easily something you could explore on your own. 
looking at alpha diversity and beta diversity, two common metrics used in the microbiome space. Formally testing for taxa different between any two pairwise, com any, uh, pairwise comparison or doing correlation between continuous variables like age or weight and microbes. Um, and we're gonna be, as, as I've mentioned, and I'll just kind of reiterate again, these apps are undergoing a lot of active development now and will be changing a lot in the coming year. And will look a lot like that space that you just um, were seeing explored in Clinepi. Okay, so with that, I'll, 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 I'll stop talking. because You're probably tired of hearing me talk. Um, and uh, I'll open it up for questions and then we'll move on in the rest of the workshop agenda. And thank you for listening, by the way. Any questions? And well, while people are thinking, um, I did want to just uh, pick up on something that you just uh, uh, demonstrated in this last illustration, especially in the context of the question that was asked by Jetsamon um, earlier. Uh, Jetsamon had asked, for example, about whether microbiome data from from uh, and the, the linkage between a microbiome DB and GEMS related to the exact same patient or just um, similar patients. And, and Dan indicated accurately that we take great care to make sure that when you think you're asking about a particular individual patient or individual study, that that is precisely what it is that, that, that you're looking at. But as I think he's also highlighted here, there are certainly uh, times where one might want to ask not just about um, infants in the GEM study, but across all samples. And, and as you'll know, Jetsamon from our genomic sites, we do take care to try to make sure to, to try to discourage users from uh, misinterpreting the data, but also enabling them to ask across a much wider range of data as Dan has just uh, um, asked here. <laughs>